Hello, welcome back to EGN 3613 Engineering Economics. I'm your professor, Dr. Ron England, and we're going to talk about present worth analysis again. We already talked about present worth analysis, but the first time we talked about it, we didn't take into account any time values of money. We just said, you make this, you spend this over time, add it all together, and look to see whether it's a good investment. However, Projects take a lot of time, and that's not exactly how it works in the real world. So let's see how it actually works in the real world. So our payback was not taking into account time value. You can't get away with that because time value does actually occur. I mean, if you can invest money or you can borrow money or you can lend money at specific interest rates, the money has time value. And you've already seen this, and hopefully by now, you're at least a little bit good at calculating that time value, bringing it all back to the present value. So we've got different techniques, um, you know, net present worth, net present value. And the net present worth, really just take the inflow, take the outflow, compare them. Okay, And the net present value is just basically saying, hey, is this worth doing? Can we make money at it bottom line all right so let's think of like when you're looking at a project what are you going to do we're going to look at an interest rate called the mar you can call it the mar it's got two r's in it minimum attractive rate of return basically that's the interest rate that says hey below this we really don't want to do this above this hey looking pretty good so what do you do? Well, we want to know what that, that number is. And we'll talk about how to get to that number. Next thing you do is you say, well, I've got a project. How long is this project going to last? Even if the project lasts forever, stretches into infinity, we've got a way we're dealing with that. Because a lot of projects, you're building a big building, the Empire State Building. It's going to be there for more than 100 years got a long service life. Essentially, that service life is essentially infinity. As far as we're concerned, numerically, um, I mean, isn't truly infinity, but as far as we're concerned, it's long. You look at what you bring in, you look at what you spend, then you get net, net cash flows. What you're going to do is you're going to look at the flows on each individual period of time. So if it's an annual, you can look at how much you're bringing in annually, how much you're bringing out annually, um, or setting expanding, and you then take those nets, the minuses, and get the present worth at the mar. That mar is important. And that'll tell you what you want to know should you accept or reject that project. So let's work forward here. Um, so the net present worth, how do you do this? Well, Again, you're going to have money going out. Typically, that money going out occurs early in the project. You would actually hope that as the project progresses, your inflows will be more than your outflows. And you can calculate those surpluses, hopefully. You're going to have some outflows. And it's not going to be surplus um, at the very beginning sometimes. But, you know, sometimes you're... You know, you start making money early and you look to see if that net project, that surplus is positive. But remember, you want the present worth of those flows. So let's look at how to do that. Um, now, often in times, in any project, doesn't matter. A lot of times you're, you're comparing multiple projects, but even if there's only one project, you're still comparing it against something because there's always alternatives like doing nothing, not spending any money on it at all. Does that mean you're not making any money off the money that you're not spending on a project to make money? <laughs> no, because you can invest that money and get a guaranteed rate of return on that money. Um, and oftentimes, we're going to talk a little bit about that risk because, because risk actually affects 
that mar, that minimum that you would consider to be attractive. Okay. So here's an example. You've got this example here where you've got an outflow in year zero. You've got three inflows, years one, two, and three. You can, and those would be net, net flows. The flows are all different. Doesn't really matter that the flows are all different because you just add up the present worse of each of those individually, which you can calculate individually. That's just present over future. You're basically taking a future value and converting it to present value at an interest rate. That interest rate is important. That 15%. We're assuming that the MAR is 15%. That isn't actually a feasible amount of money to get in you know, putting it in the bank or even investing, uh, you know, putting the money into um, different types of investments. Maybe you could, maybe you can't, but it is the MAR, okay? It is what's gonna decide whether this is an acceptable um, investment. And if that present worth is positive, it's an acceptable, pro um, an accept acceptable um, project. But all this was key upon that interest rate. Also, those estimations of what those inflows are gonna be. Because the outflow is often very rarely easy to figure out. It's what's gonna cost you to do the project up front. Those inflows might be a little bit more difficult to calculate, not always, but maybe. In Excel, straightforward. Okay, get the net present value of the pieces. And, and remember, we time adjusted them all to present worth. So, remember that interest rate, okay, that we had a 15% that we put in there. If you look at the numbers and said, let's make interest rate a variable, and let's actually plot this in this. Um, you know, what the present worth is versus the interest rate. You'll find that as the interest rate goes up, you're not making money. As the interest rate goes down, you're making money. And in the case of this one, you actually have an interest rate, in this case it's 17.45, that there is a break-even point where you actually break even. And that's what this, that previous example, if you go back and plug in 17.45, you'll find that it's zero. So any MAR less than 17.45 makes it an acceptable project. Again, we need to be able to figure out what that MAR is. And here's what you really would do. You'd say, okay, let's take that calculation and let's look at it at those interest rates. This is just a table of the previous plot. What did I do? I looked at the project. I calculated it at different interest rates, the MAR, and I found that at 17.45, the project is a break-even project. So as long as the MAR is less than 17.45, this is a pretty, I mean, this is at least going to make money. Hmm, so where's this MAR come from? Well, let's start with something that has very little risk, or we hope has very little risk. It's, uh, unfortunately, in recent times, it's actually been a little bit more iffy than I thought because this is buying U.S. Treasury bills. They have returns that are relatively low, 2%, 3% in those, in those ranges. However, the risk is still low. So we will assume that the risk of that rate of return is 2%. Now, you've also got inflation. So in other words, if you're getting 2% on your money, but inflation is 4%, you're still losing money. But if you take the rate of return there and add in the inflation, now you need an interest rate of 6% to make anything even break even, as, even with zero risk, you still need 6% to make it break even. 
So, um, you know, that is a comparative analysis. You can compare the U.S. Treasury bills and the interest rate and say, okay, 6%, anything above 6% is not worth doing it. Now, what if we don't do treasury bills? What if we do something like uh, a high-risk internet stock where there's a one in five chance or a one in five chance that you would not make the money back? Well, now you've got a risk premium associated with that investment. But that risk premium, even if the risk premium is 20%, it's also got to add in that 6% of the other pieces. So when you're picking out a MAR, which by the way, is not trivial. Um, I mean, it's trivial if I give you all the numbers. <laughs> What's not trivial is figuring out what those numbers actually are in real life. The real return plus inflation, which eats into it, plus the risk premium that you associate with the percentage, add them all together, and there is your MAR. Okay, so putting in that risk, and that's true of projects. You have return, inflation, a risk premium, and now you got to put all of those together and say, this is the number I need to exceed to make this investment, this project, whatever you're doing. So that MAR is important. The MAR is going to typically be higher than you see um, when we're talking about interest rates and things like that. We're usually talking about the 5 to 8%. The Mars are typically going to be higher. Now, there are some ways to calculate this. Um, and what we're talking about the present worth calculations. And there's a couple ways to do this. One is the investment pool. And what you're saying in the investment pool, you're saying that I have my company that has money and it has a pool of money that it can do stuff with. And it can put that money towards my project. It can put my mo that money towards other things. That's one way to do it. Whatever the project does goes back to that pool. And when it goes back to that pool, you hopefully put more into the pool than you took out. The other one is just looking at the balance and saying, oh, if I borrow this money at this interest rate, this is how I would calculate these, the amount of, you know, the present worth of it, simple interest rate. So in this case, we're looking at this and saying, okay, we've got the investment pool concept. Let's look and see what we can do there. How does this actually work? All right, so you've got an investment pool. In year one, we pull $75,000 out. And we've got a project we can do. Or we can just say, hey, what's, what's it at that MAR? Three-year project. Now, what do you do? You take... The project, what the project earns, those three numbers, okay. The original was 75,000. What would that get me at that MAR? And what's the difference between the two? Okay, and that's that net present worth of the project. Yeah, okay, straightforward. Okay, future worth, okay. Essentially, you look at it you're moving everything towards the end of life of the project. Okay. Really not any more difficult than anything that you've ever done. Okay. You take 75,000, move it to the future. 24,4, move it to the future. 27,3, move it to the future. And the 55,760, well, it's already at the date in the future. Do the calculations of those and look to see if the future worth is better with the project. If it is, again, you go with it, okay? You've done both. Whether you look at the future worth, whether you look at the present worth, same thing, okay? You want the number to be positive that want the project to actually make more money. And if you look at it and you look at the present worth and you look at this future worth, you'll find that, well, the future worth, the present worth of that future worth is the same thing. And you can do it with Excel. I highly recommend that you do it with Excel. And if you look at this in terms of present worth or future worth, calculate them both, look at the difference of them, you'll see that 
the way that you calculate the, pre the future worth of the present worth of the present worth of the future worth, you should get the same numbers. Um, we're going to skip through this. There is a tool that is available to you called the cash flow analyzer. I'm going to jump through it. I, uh, I don't rely on these tools because I don't always know that they're going to be available. Um, but this thing that you want to look at here is see that engauburn.edu. Okay. That is where this tool is again, but you can do this with Excel. In fact, everybody in this class or in my class should be able to do this with Excel because all I'm doing is I'm calculating present worth of net cash flows and moving them to the future future worth or moving them to the present worth, voila. And then plotting them. How do you plot in Excel? If you guys need me to demonstrate how to do plots, I will be happy to do that. Okay, but right now, um, so, so I'm gonna jump right through that and this is what an NPW plot would actually look like. And they do look like that. Uh, we, we, that's the second one we saw. Now the project balance count concept. Same thing that you had before, you do the nets, but what you're doing is you're actually doing this on a balance basis. You start with negative 75,000, you have some interest that you're paying on the negative 75,000, that interest goes in, you get some money back, and now the project balance is different the next year. Because you took the negative balance, you added in the negative interest, but you added in the positive amount of money that you would have made. You move on to year two, take that balance from year one, move it up to the beginning balance, paying interest on that at 15%, putting an interest there, but now you've got a payment you put towards it, and the next one is negative 43788. You move that up to the year three, and you calculate the interest on that, which is gonna be a negative number because it's a negative balance, and then you add in what you're gonna make, and then you get to the final number, which is the future worth, the 5404, okay? And, okay, you should be able to follow this. The negative 75,000 goes up to here for year one. You calculate the interest on that for one year, when it's one year, which is 15% divided by seven times 75,000. You add in the amount of money that you made, and now the project balance is here. Then you move that up to the next year. You add, um, you just, well, in this case, you add in the negative interest that's the interest on that amount of money. You add in the amount of money that you made, and there you are. And then you just year after, and you can do this year after year. Easy to do on a spreadsheet. It's kind of the way you want to do it. And you can actually diagram it and see that here's the way it actually looks if you were to put it onto a diagram. And you can see that the payback period at three years is, is fine. You've got a positive number right there. Okay, something else that we can do with this, capitalize equivalent worth. Okay, hmm, what if you have something that goes on for a long time. Engineering projects typically have long lifespans. Um, a dam, a bridge, a skyscraper, um, even the lifespan of a typical house, if there's a 30-year mortgage on a house, those are actually with an assumed that at the, even at the end of that 30-year mortgage that the house still has a value, which has probably actually gone up. So these things have a longer lifespan. You would hope that if you bought a house, 30-year mortgage, at the end of 30 years, your house has value, okay? It got a lifespan of more than 30 years. So how do you actually calculate a present worth of something that might last for 100 years? Do you just go for 100 years and do it that way? So, we can call this the capitalized equivalent worth. And what that is, is the amount of money you gotta invest right now to get a specific return every year forever with, it, with one given interest rate, okay? That is a capitalized cost, okay? It's simply, a over P. It's your A over P. 
That's it. But here's the difference. Forever. Okay. Now, you don't have to do it forever, but when we're talking about the long projects, we can do it that way. So what is this actually, what happens if you plot um, present value versus um, annualized? This is the P over A equation. What happens if you do it? If I take I equal to 5% and I plot it with Excel, which you can easily do. I gave you these equations in a spreadsheet that you have. Just take the equation, point it at N, set I equal to 5%, 0.05, and then calculate these. Hmm. If you noticed, they level off. They actually level off pretty quickly. Um, you know, at 50 years, you're almost at 40 years. You're at 19.5, and it levels off at 20. But what is 20? 20 is the inverse of I, 0.05. It's 1 over 0.05. So what you're saying is that, um, the, that the P is equal to A over I or A over 1 over I times 1 over I, which is the same as A over I. So how do we calculate this? Well, if you've got a project that lasts forever, the present worth is just basically the amount of return every single year divided by the interest rate if it's going to live to get, live forever. That's the capitalized equivalent worth. It's the present worth of a project that has an infinite um, life. So let's say you're looking at something like a bridge construction project. Now, here's the thing about projects like this. So you've got a construction cost. Um, that's an upfront, boom, cost. You've also got a specific cost. For these projects, you've got a maintenance cost. This one actually has another cost, a renovation cost, which is a quarter of the actual construction cost on a 15-year period. The thing about that is, is that renovation cost is probably not going to be always 500000 because it's going to be something probably more than that. I mean, they're predictable, but they're hard to predict. Okay. The maintenance cost, we're going to just say, hey, annual maintenance cost budgeted 50000 a year. So how do you look at this? What is, what is the present worth of a project with these parameters, with a planning horizon of infinity? in an interest rate of 5%. Well, if you look at this as cash flow, you can say, okay, well, there's $2 million out. Everything's out. Um, this is the cost. And then you got 50,000 in maintenance over the lifespan of the entire thing. And then you got these $500,000. And we're only gonna go up to year 60 with those. We're not gonna actually run those out to infinity. But we're gonna say the 50,000 goes out to infinity. So we're gonna run this thing out to year you know, 60 plus. Okay, construction cost. 2 million. The maintenance cost, okay, that is capitalized equivalent worth. It's simply the annual series divided by the interest rate. If you were to use P over A and calculate this, guess what you're going to get? And just pick a big number, you're going to get the same number. And then the renovation cost, since I only really had three, and you'll notice that um, as you move um, out into the future, you know, those maintenance costs, the present worth of those maintenance costs goes down. But, you know, as an overall fraction of the total initial cost. But here you go. The total present worth is when you add all this together. Now, the case, the case that you had four renovation costs, you're going to go ahead and put those like this. You're going to say, hey, there's, there's all of them. And um, there's another way to calculate that, but you can do it this way. And then you can do every year after the 60 years. Um, but adding all those together, 3.463 million. Okay, there's your present worth. Okay, there is another way to calculate that, that uh, P3 because it's on a 15-year cycle, not on an annual cycle, but you're talking about an annual interest rate. So you can do an effective interest rate. So um, once you do the effective interest rate, that's just, you know, what you do is you take the interest rate, you do the 15 for the years, um, subtract one, and you get that, and it's still going to give you the same number, same capitalized equivalent um, worth of that specific component. There you go. Okay, I'm pretty sure that you've gotten good at doing those effective interest rates. Um, 
If not, it really doesn't matter because you can calculate the present worth of each of those individual renovation costs. So let's talk about it. Here's a problem. It's a little bit smaller, practical problem. Um, it actually has a whole bunch of other little components to it that you have to think about. If you don't know how to do this calculation, then unit analysis will be your friend. So you're purchasing an electrical motor, 15 horsepower, 1,000 bucks. It's 10 years. So we know $1,000 current cost, 10 year life. Now, it's a 15 horsepower motor. Okay, it's 85% efficient. You're going to have an energy cost of 0.08 per kilowatt hours for 4,000 hours. Hmm, we need to turn that into a cost. Well, you can turn that into a cost because it's a cost of electricity. So the total cost of owning and operating the motor at 10% interest, which also has to be back, bought back to a present worth of that. Well, the first part's easy. You've got $1,000 that you're, you're dumping into it right at the beginning. But then you're also dumping into it 4,000 hours per year of energy that you're consuming, and you need to know what the cost of that energy is going to be. So here's some energy calculations. You have to do the conversion um, for, um, you got horsepower, and you've got, um, so what, you know, one horsepower is 0.7457 kilowatts. So if you have those in kilowatts, and now you do, and, and of course you're going to divide by efficiency because you're actually going to need 13.159 kilowatts, not 11.18, because well, it's not 100% efficient. And you are going to run it for 4,000 hours per year. So now you've got the number of kilowatt hours per year, which you can now multiply times the cost of the kilowatt hours. Notice that the units work out and you end up with dollars per year. Uh, the one thing that I did not give you was that first piece, which said that one horsepower is equal to this in kilowatts. But guess what? You know that they're both um, power, and you can look up a conversion factor. I'm pretty sure that most everybody's capable of Googling horsepower in kilowatts and getting the conversion factor. So now you know that that pump, that pump is going to cost you $4,211 per year. And you can easily calculate the total cost of the present worth of owning and operating the motor. Voila. Not that terribly hard other than uh, you had a lot of information that you had to do to calculate what it's going to cost on an annual basis to run that pump. And realize that when you're running that pump that that $4,211 is actually going to be from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And the reality is that that changes. And how likely is the cost of the power to remain the same over the 10 year lifespan? Not very likely, but it's also something that you could estimate or you could try to lock in at day one the cost of the power that you're paying for. There are ways to handle this. So if you look at this as um, a cash flow diagram, you can kind of see there's that $1,000. It costs you more to operate the pump than it did to buy the pump. But, um, and, but now you can say, hey, what is this going to cost me right now to do this project with this $1,000 pump for this project? Well, over the 10 year lifespan of the project, it didn't cost me $1,000 because you do have to take into account the cost of operating the pump. And very likely there might be a maintenance cycle in there at year five and year 10, depending upon, you know, it has a 10 year lifespan, but the reality is, is that I don't know of a lot of pumps that are capable of operating without maintenance for 10 years. So those would probably also go in and those would be costs that are associated. Now, obviously those are all outflows. There would also be inflows associated with this, but in the case of this specific project or a pump like this, you're probably saying this is required for the project to even work and operate. Now, here's something else. This pump is very likely just one piece of a much bigger project. It might be a 10-year project. And what do you do in the case where this is just a small piece 
of a larger project as an engineer, that's where you make your money because you need to be the one that can calculate all of the worths of all of the components of a project to get an end, you know, net present value or net present worth of the components of the project. Welcome to engineering. That's it for me for this lecture. I think that everything in here you should be capable of doing and following. Obviously, if you have questions, I am here to help answer the questions. And um, that's it for me. On out. Enjoyed this one. I really do. I mean, these, these projects, these large projects are actually quite interesting when you get into the real world of doing these projects. Thank you much.